say actually what's really on your mind like you said you know, that don't don't hold back on on saying things here be honest about what you really think and most people aren't you know most people in my opinion and i've certainly been in this place in my life as well much less so now most people care more much more about what other people think of them mm. than about what they think of, of themselves and that is always going to be something that holds you back Welcome to the Quest for Questions podcast. Today's guest has been helping professionals around the world grow and develop as public speakers, trainers and coaches for over 12 years. In personal life, John went from working as a flight attendant through joining an NLP cult uh, to finally uh, teaching people and businesses the ethical side of influence and persuasion. On the business side of things, he's founded Present Influence, uh, helping business owners and professionals uh, to stand out as charismatic leaders and presenters in their industry. John is also the founder of Success Books Review Club, uh, a YouTube-based blog reviewing the best of personal and professional development books. So the three main questions me and John are exploring today. What's the difference between influence and persuasion? Why do you need to master uh, public speaking and presentation skills if you want to become an uh, influential person or authority figure in your field? And finally, how do you go from an expert to an actual authority figure in your field and sell effectively without losing your soul? So this is Conrad Yerba Mate Attic here. And here's a conversation with award-winning public speaker and the host of Speaking of Influence podcast, the one and only John Ball. Enjoy. So let's let's roll. Um, I'm really excited to talk to you. Mostly, I think, because you really stood out to me because you've uh, you have you're just someone who's like really. Uh, it seems like you're super into influence and, and public speaking and kind of the ethical side of it and kind mm -hmm. of teaching people that it can also it's not this like dark side uh, only thing where it's like how oh, influence or so persuasion it means you are an evil person um <laughs> and, and and you also have some you know uh i like some uh some uh, you have some parts that you like using humor and and playfulness so this is definitely something that really overlaps with um with uh, what I enjoy doing and what I enjoy learning about. So that's why uh, I wanted uh, for us to have this conversation and dive into some topics like influence. Um, but before we go into like your expertise and your know-how and kind of your advice to people, uh, I would be really curious to, to kind of know something uh, about you before that, um, because on your site and your LinkedIn, you don't really have much info like what what was your story before like because for the past 10 years you've been uh you've been teaching people on on influence on public speaking uh and training people but before that i'm curious like how you got into like what led like what led to you becoming that person i know you were a flight attendant at some point or you were also into martial arts uh, mm -hmm. but i'm really curious like what like what was kind of the the story that led to you becoming so into like influence and persuasion and public speaking like is there even a story there or was well everyone's got a story right uh, it's, a, it's a case of we, we tend to think our, our stories aren't, aren't so interesting i think my, my story is fine it's it's not like super wild or exciting or anything it's just it's just my story but um when i was working for with the airlines as, as cabin crew um it was it was really fun you know i, I really enjoyed it as a profession and uh, that that kind of thing has always been important to me like doing work that i enjoy doing and that i find fulfilling has always been important although i say i enjoyed being cabin crew it wasn't really fulfilling, you know, it fulfilled, it fulfilled that travel need in me that I got to see a lot of the world and I got paid for doing it. Um, and, you know, it, it had, it's had it mo its moments, but it had its downsides as well. And, and especially um, after a long time of doing it, it was like being jet lagged all the time started to mm. get very, very tiring. I, and I knew I didn't want to do it forever as well. You know, and I, I'm kind of like, a, 
I'll, I'll do something for like, 10 years max if I really enjoy it. And then it's going to be time to move on, I think. And, and it's still uh, a lot. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and I think that's where most people are these days anyway. Is like no, nobody really um, should be thinking about having a job for life anymore anyway, because I'm not sure those things exist. But uh, uh, I, I already had that in my head that I didn't want to do that forever. And uh, But I didn't know what I did want to do. So so that was the thing of like, you know, I, I did a degree in law and English at, school, at university and and seemed like I was going to go and be a lawyer. But then after doing my degree, I was like, oh, I hate this. I don't want to do this for a, for a living. It's like, why am I even doing it? Doing it is doing it because it was one of those things that, oh, it's a solid job and you can make lots of money and you have a good life. I was like, yeah, but I don't, I don't enjoy it. I, I don't want to do it. And so I kind of drifted for a while. And luckily enough, uh, the, the, the drift took me towards, uh, towards hospitality and, uh, um, and the airline industry. And whilst I was working there, I did a trip one time with a lady who, um, you, know, you can imagine they have crew briefings right before every flight. So mm. all the crew have to be go through the safety briefing, you have to be tested on your safety knowledge, all that kind of stuff. Not, not very exciting, but essential to happen before every trip. And it's a bit of time for the crew to get to know each other as well. So one of the in-charge crew members on one trip that I did, it was like a week long, what they call back to back to two trips stateside. Um, she was uh, a life coach, possibly still is. And, uh, and she started talking about coaching and I had never heard about it before. And um, so I was really fascinated. I had always been marginally interested in psychology, but hadn't actually mm. wanted to do it a, as a profession. Uh, but she started talking about coaching and it was all very solution focused and things like this. So um, whilst we were away, I think we were in Philadelphia, first of all, um, she gave me a few book recommendations. She said, if you're really interested in it, check these out. And so I went to a bookshop in Philadelphia and bought both the books she recommended. I found them both there. And by the end of the week, I'd already read them. And I was saying to her, where else do I go? Uh, where, where can I get more information? And then I did, uh, she gave me some e information on a coaching certification course. So that's where I first um, got into coaching and personal development. Uh, and what were the books? Um, the, the books are, are books that I wouldn't actually recommend now. Ah, okay. <laughs> okay, I got it, I got it. Interestingly enough, uh, whilst they were fascinating to me at the time, it's not like, um, I, I wouldn't necessarily, one of them may be, um, but uh, one of them was like the power of your subconscious mind, the Dr. Joseph Murphy book. I kind of think a lot of it's sort of BS now, but, but it was interesting to me at the time. And um, the other one was uh, the hypnotist Paul McKenna, if you, if you know him. I, I still think that stuff was fine. I mean, it was good content and, and I found it really helpful. So, but I don't know if I'd necessarily recommend it. Um, in, and a sort of hypnosis is something you wanted to um, get more into. But uh, that, that journey started taking me deeper into learning and personal development and wanting to improve myself and thinking, I knew that that was something that I could do as a career. I felt very, hmm. uh, very close to it and very much like it, it, it resonated with me as a, a sort of, yeah, I like this because like, lots of people always, I guess I'm kind of an open person. So lots of people have always come to me with their problems and their issues oh. and stuff. So and you connected always, the dots in a way. Yeah. Um, I, I'd always had this thing of when people did that, that I didn't want to just be the person who was like, okay, well, I'm just going to take all of that on board and you unload all your problems on me. It's always like, okay, well, you know, you told me all of this. So now what are you going to do? <laughs> What's your plan of action? Don't just come and tell me all your problems. Tell me what you're going to do about it. And, and that's where I, I sort of like that. That's where I felt the coaching was very much in alignment with what I already felt that I did naturally with people was sort of saying, let's start thinking about a way forward. Let's start looking at solutions and possibilities here rather than just saying, okay, well, here's my problem and isn't it sad and be sad with mm. me. So uh, that's not helping you. So, um, so yeah, that was, that was kind of like the start of the journey into personal development. But when it comes to the sort of influence and persuasion stuff specifically, that came from reading a book uh, on, on that journey. It was like a personal development website called Simpleology, which is still going, still around, um, with a guy called Mark Joyner, who's an interesting character. And um, he had a downloadable book on there called Mind Control Marketing. And that was where I was first introduced to this, this sort of idea or concept of all these sort of invisible strings that are being pulled to manipulate us and uh, affect our decision making and uh, influences in, in ways that we 
may not be aware that we're being influenced, whether whether for good or for bad. That was to me, that was like having the the veil lifted, the blindfold removed, and that like seeing this whole new mm. world of some stuff that was going on behind the scenes. Um, you know, I don't know if you, you've ever seen that film. I think I'm going to forget what it's called now. I think it's called like Them or something like that. But whereas like this guy gets these special sunglasses and he suddenly sees that there's all these aliens taking over the world. Oh, <laughs> it's kind of yeah. like seeing seeing these things that are going on invisibly behind what's, what uh, seems like reality. That's what it felt like. And that sparked mm. my interest in the world of influence and persuasion. And it grew from there. Mm. And, and at that time, like what was your um, kind of, plan like you where you just think you go oh i'm just gonna plan. learn it for oh my myself. god <laughs> there not, was no plan <laughs> okay okay maybe not plan but like what were you thinking at that point in a way of like uh were you just interested in it personally like oh hey i want to like yeah initially initially mm -hmm. initially and then um and then i got invited to uh one of these big weekend events where they were um teaching neurolinguistic programming and I'd never heard of it before, and so I NLP, thought it would yeah. be interesting. You know what neuro linguistic programming is? NLP, yeah. NLP. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Just so, um, so one of the the guy who I'd done my coaching certification with uh, invited me and said, "You should go. This is going to be really helpful to to anyone who's in coaching. It's a really really valuable elements to add to your coaching tool belt." And um, so, so I went along and it, it, blew, it blew my mind. I have to admit, it blew my mind quite a lot. Uh, and it was a really powerful, really powerful event. In, in fact, I enjoyed it so much um, that I ended up you know, signing up to, to their programs right at that weekend, even though I didn't have the money for it. And, um, and started um, doing my uh, neuro-linguistic programming training with them, what they call the results and master results levels. And, uh, you know, the whole time thinking, I, I think I might have joined a cult. <laughs> I'm not sure. Mm. I may have just paid to join a cult. Um, but, you know, that, that I soon, soon got over that and, uh, uh, and started to realize what, what I was learning was more of these sort of things of uh, being able to use um, almost, like, almost like psychological tricks uh, uh, and be able to sort of get access to make certain bypasses that where we often block change in ourselves or think we can't do things um, that we can actually help get around some of those things. No, I, I think I feel like I've sort of developed a lot since then as well. Like I continue my learning. I know that some of the stuff I learned back then is, is kind of rubbish really <laughs> some mm. but but some of it isn't and uh, you know when you're learning it and you're being taught it well you think oh this is really good this is really powerful stuff and, and there's levels of it where you can even convince yourself that it's actually really effective and works um like many things you know cognitive bias is a very powerful yeah. tool um but um you know, so, some of it is really useful and, and does definitely work but some of it is a bit more dodgy and uh, and that's what, but that that was um another thing of like well you know i've done all that but i i'm the kind of person who likes to do the background reading i like to go deeper i, I want to know more i want to know where stuff comes from and why it works and and what what other options there are so um that for me was that sparked my learning journey where i started reading more uh, and listening to lots more audio books and and finding the content that actually um like maybe unwrapped things a bit more and and showed me what what was legit there and what was maybe kind of rubbish mm. so it seems like you were not satisfied with just like scratching the surface of it and mm. you, you just wanted to kind of go down uh, in a way of what i do here with the podcast go down the rabbit hole of truth like what's like what's what's bullshit what's not like what what is it really all about yeah, yeah that, you know the, this is this is kind of a weird thing and it, it may be specific to me but other people may have had similar experiences but the people who i was learning from um they kind of hid to some degree where their information came from. It's like kind of everybody knows that everyone who knows about NLP knows that it comes from um, you know, Grindler and uh, Grindler and Bandler. And um, so, so you knew that and you could research them, but there was a lot of other stuff in there as well. And like, uh, unless you actually got told uh, names, it was very hard to, to do the research and see where stuff had come from. So, um, there's sometimes very, people are very protective of, of their 
IP, but you know, I even ended up discovering that their, their intellectual property wasn't actually even even their own. It was mm. uh, let's say let's be nice and say borrowed, uh, but it wasn't their own. Uh, and so it was um, that that was the thing of well, why why hold that stuff back? You know, there's this whole, it seemed to be this whole fear that if you know, if you know all of this, you're going to go and do it yourself and we don't want the competition. And mm. Well, you know, why, why are you doing this? You either do this because you, you, know, you want to help people or you're doing it because you just want to make money. You, you can have both. Um, but I, I just felt at that point, it was like I had my doubts about some of the ethical things that were going on there. And so I thought, you know, I, I really feel like I need to know more about this i don't just want the surface level i am I'm, I'm a, a still waters run deep kind of guy you know i might seem sort of fairly uh, fairly placid and, and calm but you know I, I, there's a lot going on under the surface and and I, and I do really like to dive deep into subjects that i'm interested in and and i will happily spend hours even years doing doing reading and research to to get to know more about it um, because I think that it, it can start to really open things up for people. And so when I teach stuff, I, I don't hide where it comes from. It's like, I, I don't want anyone thinking, uh, trying to pass off that I've created stuff that I haven't at all. I'm never going to try and take credit for anyone's anyone else's work, and nor am I going to try and hold back anyone who wants to go deeper on the research. Because in, in my mind, uh, uh, you know, my thinking is, if somebody wants to do what I do, bring it on. You know, is that if if you're competition for me, then great. That I can work with that. Uh, and if you're better than me and you you take more business than me, then you deserve it. Because if you're doing a better job than I'm doing, you deserve the business. Mm. So, uh, but if you're spreading, no, if you're adding to the voices that are teaching more people um, you know, to be able to get up on a, a stage or an online platform and and teach, inspire, motivate people in some way, shape, or form, um, then I'm more power to you. That, mm -hmm. That's my, my view on it. And where do you think? Because that that was like my um, like that's kind of like question. I was kind of. Um... Uh, <laughs> being born in my mind is that uh, you know at some point in that in that journey into this like psychology NLP when you were speaking about it um, it seems like you had like you know two paths um, one is the the typical which is you know it's like uh, well you can down uh, to speak to put it nicely like the the the, the kind of evil path in a way uh, where where you like you use it and you use it like to your benefit you know what I mean like you learn the influence you're in persuasion and you kind of use it to let's say earn more money get more business you know kind of um, I know influence some people close to you but I mean not even like in the wrong way but uh, and the whole NLP stuff also like it, it there's a lot of like negative stuff there that a lot of people get into and they never kind of get out of it like get mm -hmm. they get pulled by it but it seems like from your story that you know you you quite immediately when you got into it you had like oh I, I don't want to go this path I want to be the person who like learns about it but then kind of shows people the positive side of it that uh that uh you know kind of uh, shows the positive side of it and teaches people about it and is very like transparent about it so what do you think was that uh, like that uh, kind of that spark that that made you go this way like wh were you always just was it like your values that you you are a person yeah. that's just like a good person and and you couldn't <laughs> couldn't I don't, I don't think it's that black and white but mm -hmm. um uh, I think I, I think I do have a very strong ethical center and uh, and that probably has a lot to do with with my upbringing and um, you know I, I was I, I will say I was I was brought up in a, a very religious household I'm not at all religious now but my, my family still are and uh, you know I, I'm the uh, the black sheep atheist of the family now but um, it is it it's still I, I just have this strong desire for things to be right you know like one of my we all have these role models this is something that you learn in nlp anyway but we all have we do like modeling like who who are your role models especially when you're like around the ages of eight to eight to thirteen is that a strong imprinting time where you're deciding who your role models are i i was big into superhero comics so so like my role models were people like superman and spider-man this comic books certainly at that time i think even now 
the heroes all have a very strong ethical center of like have to do what's right all the time and sometimes even to the level of being a bit sort of uh, over the top with that but you know there's it really that more than more than my sort of religious upbringing imprinted in me this desire of have to do at least try to do the right thing and it doesn't always work out but you know it's important to honesty is important doing the right thing is important not trying to trick people or, or um you know just get your get your own way all the time these things these things matter and so in that environment when i started to have ethical concerns for ways other people were using some of these tools um that did spark in me a desire to to at least show people as i um, you may not realize exactly how you're being influenced and manipulated here. And, you know, what I will say, one of the things that, that really brought that home for me was, uh, was remembering a time, I'm trying to think how old I was at the time. I think I was about 18, 17 or 18 at the time. And I went to the US um, for my summer break by myself. The first time I ever went away by myself anywhere. Um, but it was, like, at the time, I was still very involved in, in the, my family's church and so I had actually gone to teach Sunday school for a summer mm. uh, at uh, um, a church in New Jersey and, and I'll say it was it was fun and it wasn't really uh, doing any teaching it was more like um, you know, the kids that were coming were more like nursery school age so mostly it was just playing games and coloring in pictures and stuff it was pretty easy and uh, and then I sort of traveled down the coast a bit and um, ended up spending some time sort of further south mm -hmm. south in Washington um, but you know the it's like Bible, that was bible belt area where, where i ended up going to and um you know, i was going to to church with these people all really really nice people um but also at a time when i was dealing with a lot of stuff that was going on in, in myself as well as well where i already felt like i was moving away from from religion anyway mm. and uh was also dealing with my own sexuality at the time and stuff like that and it was like you know there was a lot going on under the surface and we went to this um christian theme park I don't know if people even know these things exist, but I know. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was a Christian theme park. So it was called, uh, it may still be there. It's called King's Dominion. And, um, and so I remember it really well. We had this big day out there and it was just like any other theme park, but obviously a, a religious theme. There, there weren't any rides where you get crucified or anything like that. It wasn't that religious. But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, um yeah, they was uh, at the end of the day they have they'd have like a big revival thing, which is like a big sort of uh, come to Jesus moment, and uh, and I just remembered that whole thing being really emotional, and like the the people who were speaking, the preachers, like really whipping up the emotion, and all the music was really emotional, and uh, uh, and it just felt really really manipulative. The oh, whole okay. thing felt really, really manipulative. And, and it was there that I, that was maybe the first time where I'd ever taken a step back from what was going on and not being in it, just kind of observing it and seeing what's really going on here. Like, what are they actually saying? People were going up on the stage to dedicate their lives to Jesus. And it's like, well, why are they? Why are they doing that? That what has even been said here that would make them think that that was a really good thing to do? And I don't think it was anything other than being swept along by the emotion of the experience. Although I now know that a lot of these places actually get people prepared in advance to you know, give either given them money or they're already part of the organization that they go up on the stage first mm. so that other people kind of think, oh, well, they're doing it. You know, so again, it's a manipulation that one that you, know, you may not be aware of, but that that can happen too. Uh, and that's where I was took back and this is really dodgy. It's like, you know, if you, if you actually spoke to these people the next day and say, well, why did you do that? You know, if, if it was genuine, why did you actually get up on the stage? I'm not sure they'd be able to give you an answer. And what do you know about Jesus? Well, you know, nothing really. Uh, so, <laughs> and yet you've gone up on the stage and said, oh, I'm going to dedicate my life to it. And, and so it was those, kind, those kinds of things that I think, I think they go on all the time. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying that anyone who's, anyone who's religious is uh, isn't entitled to their beliefs and just kind of thing the the way that those people came to came to it perhaps or were being introduced to it was really manipulative and uh, and i and i didn't like it and when you start to see how many parts of society um have have those things going on 
how much conditioning controls us, how many, how much things are set up to get us to act a certain way. It's, it's actually mind blowing. Yeah. It's mind blowing, but mostly we don't think about it because we're in it. We, we rarely stop and take a step back to observe it. Or we are afraid. No. Yeah. Like we, yeah, yeah. like I think that's a part of it. Uh, I'm sorry if I if I break your your process. No, 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 carry on. No, I would say that I think the big part of it, at least from my experience, that I think, um, you know, I think some people have this like doubt in their head, like, oh, it, am I really? Does it really make sense? But I think not too many many people have, uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, however you want to say it, uh, courage to like go there, question things, to 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 try a different path to go against the grain you know it's like it's hard i mean it's 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 hard right like it's 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 not yeah. easy it's it's a lot easier to follow the crowd definitely yes you know and, and sometimes you, you sometimes look back in life and think oh i wonder what made me that way it's like well when i look back on my life i i had to go against the crowd in order to to be myself you know it would have been um if, if i could have gr grown up heterosexual you know would, there would never have been an issue but because i had to come out about who i was and and if i wanted to live an honest lifestyle um that was one of those things that you know you know when you have to do something like that the world may never be the same afterwards like people mm. you love might not accept you uh friends and family might turn their backs on you and, and some did and uh you know certain environments like i i was kicked out of the church but not, not because of that <laughs> because of something else but um but you know i was essentially kicked out of my of my church i was still allowed to go but i wasn't allowed to be a member um but um you know i i, I was drifting away from it anyway and um but you, you know that you have to step outside of the mainstream in order to be able to do that. Uh, less so now, you know, it's like in most places, in, in most sort of the civilized world, it's not such a big deal. Uh, but, uh, but at that time it really was. And uh, you, you really don't know how, how your family are going to be. I'm, I'm lucky. My family are fantastic, but uh, it took time. <laughs> it took time to get there. Um, but I just, I, I do sort of think, yeah, I can look back and I think, I, I, I was in some way prepared for being at least willing to step out of what everyone else does and see the world in a slightly different way, because really I had no choice. Mm. And, and when you do, when you step outside, when you, anytime you step outside of the mainstream, um, first of all, people are going to criticize you for it, or even maybe, uh, even maybe beat up on you for it. Um, but, uh, you know, ultimately if, if you're, if you're living your truth, um, you find your way, you find your way through it. But uh, it, I think it's essential to to take those steps back out, out to, uh, and see what's really going on. Most of us are filling us filling ourselves and our lives with distractions, and we have every opportunity to distract ourselves as much as possible. Now, there's always you know, this year, especially. There's so much going on, um, and, and like in the political climate, there's so much going on. There, there's always things you can distract yourself with. And I do honestly think for many people the the quarantine periods that they've had uh, this year have been um, a, a wake up in some ways or an opportunity to actually stop and think about things. And you know, I, I know a lot of people have been reevaluating their lives and thinking about things a little bit differently because because they've had the time to do it. And you know, there's only there's only so much Netflix you can watch when you're stuck at home. You like, um, you know, at some point you say, like, "Well, I'm not going to start watching all the cheesy rubbish on Netflix that I don't want to see." It's like, well, okay. At some point, you think you need to do something else, or actually, just that we never really allow ourselves to be bored long enough to start start thinking about things. Thinking about things takes a lot of brain work. Our yeah. brains use a lot of energy. And so naturally, it's fairly natural that we don't really want to spend too much time thinking about things. We'd rather run on automatic because it's easier. Yeah, especially once you get older and older, right? Like the, the, the <laughs> kind of, no, I mean, that's, yeah, that's, yeah. that's partially true. Like the, 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 it the, is the, true, yeah. It's goal, the goal of mind is to like put things on automatic because it saves energy, like in the long run. Well, you know, um, there, there's, uh, there's always been that saying that like, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. So I think you, you maybe hear it less now um, because we know it's not true. We, we know now that we yeah. have neuroplasticity. We know that we can still learn um, 
in you know, as long as we're alive, we can still learn. We have neuroplasticity for all of our lives. People, even in later life, who've had strokes that have disabled part of their body, have been able to learn new ways of operating and create new neural pathways to operate the limbs and and come back and recover from from the strokes, at least partially, if not fully, um, because of because of this. And so we we still have capabilities to change, to learn, but we're not always willing to do so. Mm-hmm. So I think that comes down more to uh, to comfort zones and uh, cognitive biases, but also conditioned levels of thinking. Most of us have very conditioned thinking. Mm, mm, okay. But we've already dived into that rabbit hole. Uh, I wanted to kind of, uh, you know, steer us back into the, the, the um, influence side of things. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm because uh, one thing that you said, and, and I wanted to kind of uh, preface before we dive into influence, is that the reason you know learning about persuasion and influence, not even for your benefit, but a lot of it is also for your protection, right? Like you want to mm-hmm. learn about it because there is, as you said, a lot of things and people and organizations and, and ideologies, everything that tries to in in every day they they try to influence you they try to persuade you and if you yeah. don't they are not aware of it you basically are not able to protect yourself yes i, I think so uh, and i view it like um you know harry potter's defense against the dark arts except except this is this is real you know the the, the kind of mind magic that go that goes on is is real and and there's a degree to which you can, uh, to which you can, I think, defend yourself, but it does require having knowledge about how these things operate. Not everybody cares. Not everybody wants to know, is that? Um, m- most people are quite happy to go on being manipulated by certain sources of information and uh, or by certain environments and, and um, societal pressures that, that um, you know, just kind of happy because because if you start challenging it, your life may change. Certainly if your, if your perspective changes and you change, your life is going to change. And some of the people around you may not like it. Some of the people, uh, some of the things that go on in your life may have to change because of it. And so that's why often they say people are afraid of it. It's not necessarily that they're afraid of it. They're afraid of the consequences of it. They're afraid that if you actually start thinking about things, you might have to do something about it. Mm. Yeah, that's very true. So how would you, that, that, that's, I think, a good starting point. So how would you, in, in your own words, like how would you define like what is influence? Because it's such mm-hmm. a, you know, it's, it's kind of like voodoo, like. <laughs> uh, well, you know, influence and persuasion are different things. And um, so, but they, they very often go hand in hand. So influence, I see more as something, influential is something you are. Uh, persuasive is some, something you do. You, you are, you can be persuasive but you you persuade people so you have influence and but you do persuasion Mm. so that that's the way the way i think about it and there are things we can do to increase our influence like influence would be something like somebody has authority in a particular situation and um so politically spiritually something like that someone who's in a very high position uh, or elevated position that uh, even, even a teacher at school, you know, they have influence, they have uh, influence that comes with that position uh, that you, you know, as a student, you look up to them. And so what they say, you're more likely to take as being serious than, than or you, know, you might say, well, it must be true because my teacher is saying to me or somebody who knows more than I do is saying it to me. And uh, whereas that, that may not actually be true. And, um, but the influence that they have makes you think it probably is and brings with it a level of respect that uh, that may get you to to sometimes give more respect to people or things than than they may actually deserve mm. so so that's more that's more influence influence is more like your 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 character your position your the things about you the the way you speak and the things that uh, um, and your level of confidence in a, in a particular situation. Confidence is probably one of the, the biggest uh, influential tools. Um, but persuasion is something that you actively do. And we all, we all do these things every day. We all have our own level of influence. We all have our own levels of persuasion as well. We, even on ourselves, we're always like, oh, am I, am I going to have that second breakfast? Am I gonna, uh, do I have two cups of coffee? Or, or um, no, oh, try this, try, try this, it's delicious. Or oh, try this, it's horrible. Um, no, we're always influencing and persuading each other. It's, it's really a case of uh, there are a lot of people out there who are influencing and persuading each other 
uh, or persuading other people to part with their money or to to do things that are against their own best interest and that's something that uh, i i feel i can help do something about okay okay so i want to explore like two 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 paths here so one is um like the building of influence and another is like protecting against it so um so let's maybe try first with with building because that's mm -hmm. a topic very close to my heart as me and uh kind of a, like a, a a mentor such partner we are now working on a certain project which basically involves building uh business people's influence but the problem we are having is that it's very we find it's very irrational like you can't really pinpoint like the exact you know like ladder steps okay we will you will speak here and and one of your i think uh sentence is that if you want to be an influential person in any field you need to master public speaking and presentation skills so I think uh, in, in, uh, in your view, and that's something we agree on and I would want to explore is that you believe that, you know, kind of public speaking or in a way presenting, you know, your ideas or, or, or speaking in public is one of the, the best ways to, to uh, increase your, your, your influence. Um, I do think that. And I what, think it has been for centuries, yeah. What, what do you think uh, is, is, the, is the mechanism behind that? Partly, uh, partly conditioning actually, because uh, because that has been the case for as as long as we have probably as long as we have recorded history. Um, I I was privileged recently to to have on my podcast a, a guy who is uh, an expert in Stoic philosophy, and the reason mm. I ended up having him on because my show is about public speaking and presentation skills. You know, well, what's Stoicism got to do with that? Um, the reason I had him on was was primarily because I love stoicism, but also because um, in, in his recent book about Marcus Aurelius, he was talking about um, that Marcus was taught in um, the arts of philosophy. Uh, they taught philosophy and they taught uh, oration and uh, sophistry. So the, the tools of public speaking, because the in the Senate, in the Senate of, of Rome, they, they had to have those skills. The leaders were expected to be able to speak and speak well. Even in modern politics, we still see that. In, in the world in general, we see the leaders who stand out are the ones who can speak well and the ones who, who know how to connect with an audience, connect Donald with a Trump. crowd. Well, yeah, Trump's actually a really good example yeah. of it. Uh, even even though a lot of what he says is horrible, um, he's a really good example of being able to to work a stage and work a crowd and uh, and you know, get get emotions whipped up and use those uh, sort of uh, three three word phrases. You know, it's like I don't think he's he's uh, the political genius that he likes to think he is, but uh, but certainly what he has done. Um, no, it, it, it was very, it was very smart in some in some levels, and uh, and very, certainly very effective. So you know, he he gained a lot a lot of support from that. But you know, you see it even in, um, I would even say you know someone like Barack Obama was mm. one of the things, one of the reasons that that he won uh, the presidential election um, was because of his ability of in public speaking. I'd say a bit less so with Joe Biden. You know, he's not such a not such a great speaker. But you know, in the, in the UK, Boris Johnson is like, I'm not I'm not a fan, but he's a really good speaker, uh, and, and I think that's again one of the reasons why he is is still actually, despite everything that's actually going on there, he's still doing quite well in opinion polls and things like that because people like his oration they like his speaking uh, steve jobs was an excellent example of that in business and uh, you know the, there were so many great examples of it but you know leadership and public speaking they go hand in hand you have to be able to do it and it is you know people who can speak well we uh, we naturally assume that they are smart that they are leaders that that they uh so so there are things that sort of start to automatically click in our heads when somebody's on a platform and they're really owning it and doing it well there mm. so what 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 in your eyes what, what what does it take to be a great uh public speaker to to be like what, like these guys like what, what's their what's their secret sauce <laughs> it it takes it, i think it takes being who being able to own who you are and being able to to be that on a stage there's a level of um generally there's a level of vulnerability in in that for most people for some it's not exclusively true but for most for most great public speakers like 
I don't class Trump as a great public speaker. I just class him as a very effective one. He, he's actually a horrible speaker when you hear, when you hear the stuff he talks about. Is, a lot of it's incoherent. But someone like Barack Obama is a great public speaker because his messages are coherent and they're very emotive, in a very emotional, in a positive way, generally. And um, so you see anyone who can get up on stage and get people uh, on side, um, it's their personality that does it. They have to bring energy. They have to bring... Um, they, they have to bring emotion. You know, one of the, uh, something that they teach in NLP, but it's very true for public speaking is that um, you, if you want to get somebody into a particular emotional state, you have to put yourself in that state mm. first. And that's something that, that great speakers and presenters can do and can get very good at doing. Uh, and also getting unfazed by what's going on around them and getting very focused on creating that connection with their audience, um, letting them in a bit with, with stories. So, you know, um, it's, it has to look and feel natural, which also means it has to be really well practiced. There's very few people who can just get up on a stage and it just seems very natural and practiced to them. Some, some people can, but for most people, it takes a lot of work to get to that level of looking natural and being, uh, being comfortable on a stage or platform. So, so what would be your, because I want to also kind of take it down to like ground level in a way for, for people mm -hmm. to get as many takeaways. Um, so it's not just so like abstract or like these are great sure. speakers, but like what, so, so what would you be like your um, advice for like building blocks of, of, of um, well, I, I don't know if it's, if it's better to ask you that about public speaking or influence in general, because one question I had in my mind is like, besides public speaking, what are some biggest building blocks to, for someone to go from, let's say like me or someone who's like, an expert in their field, but they're not influential in that, in that field. What are the building blocks? Um, so maybe, maybe let's go into, into that. What do you think? Sure. So, the, so the, maybe there are two levels with that. So if, if anyone's sort of thinking, oh, I would like to be more influential and, and maybe I should be thinking about doing presentation and public speaking work, uh, then absolutely do it. And uh, the most important thing is to just start, just start doing it and start finding things to speak about and go to a Toastmasters club or something like that, because, you know, they'll give you things to talk about and, and encourage you and give you feedback on, on your presentations and stuff. And, you know, you can go for free. Uh, and then if, when you join, you can actually start working on projects and, and prepared speeches and things. Uh, I think that's the, th the first thing that has to happen for, for anyone who wants to be uh, more influential. Either, either you start working with somebody privately to help you develop that. Um, but I mean, even if you're doing that, still go to uh, find a group or a club where hopefully you can um, you can go either online or in person at the moment because a lot of these things are online right now um, and and go and just get started uh, start practicing your public speaking skills start practicing your improvisational skills from the stage or being able to get up and just talk about anything for a few minutes once you once you start getting comfortable with that then then there are levels of um, just being able to own the stage and the platform that you're on, um, understanding how you speak and what you say and how you say it is uh, is all really important, and, um, and and bringing in those emotional levels into what you do as well. And I would say, you know, the the levels that these are where you start to move into levels of mastery. It was going to be where you start introducing uh, humor or emotional stories or more drama into your presentation, you know, uh, start mastering storytelling and things like that, so that you uh, you really bring people in, into your world and, and what you're talking about is, is ultimately that becomes about engagement and having people really um, hang on what you're saying. Uh, but the, those are the tools that have to really be there for that to work. Mm. So, so you're basically saying that, that like, still like the public speaking is the number one key to, to being a person of influence, like, or are there any other it, things you have? The, on? There are, there are other things as well. I, th I say it's one of the, one of the best ones. Mm -hmm. uh, I, th I still think it's really super important. Um, you know, writing a book, it, it makes somebody uh, an in influential person as well. Um, you know, but there are people who, uh, there are, many people now who just have uh, large followings of people just because they're putting out lots of content on on youtube or instagram or whatever it's like well you know have people following you for whatever but it, it ultimately depends on what you want to do what you want to achieve and um, if, if you're looking to to go big in the business world yeah i think you have to be able to um to present yourself really well and and you have to be able to communicate really effectively mm, okay 
because there is a thing I wanted to ask you, like, what are, what's like the biggest uh, number one, like misconception, which I think for, from my side um, that I see, and I'm curious about your take on um, that. It's that people confuse like um, influence with popularity. Mm -hmm. mm, do you think that's the number one misconception? Maybe let's explore that. Or do you think mm. there's some other um, on I your... I don't know if I've ever really thought about misconceptions in this before, but yeah, I, I, I would say that would be one. Um, so yeah, people who are influential are not necessarily popular or, and certainly not popular with, with everyone. Um, the, if you think that everyone has to like you, then then that's going to be a, a conflict as well. Because um, really, I think to be to be influential, you have to be willing to polarize people somewhat. Um, because if you want everyone to like you, and if you're not saying anything that might get a few people's backs up, you're just being bland. Uh, if you're just being normal, um, it's not very interesting. It's not very exciting. So. Um, anything that that gives you a step out of normal increases engagement and and i'm not saying like just say controversial stuff just uh, just to get a following i'm just saying say actually what's really on your mind like you said you know, that don't don't hold back on on saying things here like be honest about what you really think and most people aren't you know most people in my opinion and i've certainly been in this place in my life as well much less so now most people care more, much more about what other people think of them mm. than about what they think of, of themselves. And that is always going to be something that holds you back. Mm. Wow, that's, uh, that's powerful. I mm. hope people take note. Any other misconceptions about influence or maybe persuasion, if, you, if you, that's something easier for you to... <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I think um, maybe, uh, maybe misconceptions could be that it, that it's always a negative thing or, or that people who are aware of it are, uh, are manipulative, but, um, we're manipulation and manip being manipulative in itself is like, again, it's a, it's a method of persuasion. We all do it. We do it all the time. Sometimes it is to get our own way, but the, the thing that ultimately, uh, you know, with bigger levels of this that you end up looking at is, um, what's your integrity here and, and integrity. Are, are, you, are you in are you in living in integrity with what you're doing are you actually ripping people off and and so maybe there's i think there probably are many misconceptions that people have in this area influencers in general you know i'm i'm, I'm not an influencer in terms of what we now consider to be an influencer online um you know i'm, I'm i i someone like taylor swift for example who has a really huge online following you now she suddenly says oh i like this soft drink everyone's gonna all her fans are gonna be like oh let's start buying that you know is so that that so influencers can be very powerful in, in that sort of sense but but that really is the sort of case of you know people are in their orbit and sort of thinking i want to be more like that um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fan of that person. I like what they do. I like how they say, I like what they say. And so I want to be more like them. So if they say something is really good, I'm going to believe them and I'm going to say, okay, well, you know, they're saying it's really good. Even they may be getting paid to say it, but you know, I, I'm more likely to go with that anyway. Um, it can be really, it can be really powerful. And, and you even may have awareness that that's exactly what's going on, but you're okay with it because it's like, you really like that person. It's, it's, uh, uh, so a lot of people are very negative on the whole sort of influencer thing, but you know, especially with like, I know a lot of people don't like the Kardashians and, and things like that. I have, I'm not a fan, I, I, I'm, but I'm not anti them either. It's like they're they're famous for a reason. That people follow them for a reason, and and you know I'm, I'm not willing to to judge everyone for who they follow. But they've become influential because they played the game really really well, and mm. uh, and they have all these people following them. And you know, in, in my opinion, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to be one of them. But uh, but good luck to them. You know that's what that's what they're doing, and people are willing to do it. So. Yeah, have at it, enjoy it while it lasts. Um, but you know, the that that's the nature of things, and people, people, and the nature of fame and celebrity, which is uh, one of the reasons why it's something I, I never went for anyway. So yeah, I think maybe getting away from misconceptions here, but mm -hmm. um, misconceptions about um, 
persuasion would definitely be more than ones about that it's it's all for for negativity it's all for uh, uh negative manipulation it's all for getting your own way and it's not it's not it's not necessarily the case there there are tools or as robert cialdini calls them uh, weapons of influence and persuasion and uh, when you understand them you can understand they they can be used for good or bad same as any tool you know, you can you can take an axe and you can chop down a, a tree to to make wood for a fire or to build a house, or you could use the axe to cut down the house and chop exactly. it down and destroy it. So, I mean, the the, the tools themselves are neither good or bad. Uh, it's the person using them. Mm, mm. The intention. Yeah, persuasion is like a little bit that came to my mind. It's slight, and probably you have a take on that. Uh, it's slightly similar to seduction like it's it has a negative connotation for no reason because i feel like uh it, it's a bit of a different topic but but like seduction i think is in a similar layer when i was exploring that that it's like a lot of people perceive it as negative but it's actually not yeah um it, it's certainly a part of persuasion seduction is part of a, a persuasion um robert green's book on the laws of seduction is really interesting and and again you know, there, there are people out there like these days i don't know if they're still really around i, I guess probably these people who are like seduction coaches who heard of this and so the, there are people who are, are teaching essentially it's nearly i think it's exclusively guys who are teaching other guys how to get laid as much as possible that that's essentially what it comes to and um so they're they're teaching particular nlp techniques and influence and persuasion techniques to help them get more women into bed and um you know is, well is, is that is that a, a a bad thing maybe maybe um it's you know to, to me it's a bit it's a bit sleazy I, i'm not a fan but uh ultimately it's like if, if you can talk if you can talk someone into bed with you have have you really done anything wrong <laughs> uh, have you you know it's not we're not talking brainwashing here we're not talking yeah. uh we're not talking like drugging someone's drinks that stuff is like undoubtedly wrong you know uh, um but that's not seduction <laughs> it's not seduction and we're not talking getting someone to do something against their will um but you know there, there may be a sort of thing of uh is it uh is it ethically right to to just try and sleep with as many people as possible i, I think that's the kind of question yeah. you have to answer yourself right i mean it's uh um but it's not uh, the tool as you you were saying it's it's not like you then have in your own power what you do with it right like you yeah but so seduction in itself isn't necessarily isn't necessarily sexual right so yeah exactly um, it's not yeah yeah there so the there is the levels at which um you know people can can become more seductive or attractive to you uh with certain things like humor uh comedy is a really powerful seduction tool um because you know, we're generally attracted more and again not necessarily sexually but we are generally attracted more to people who make us laugh so whether that's a more of a social attraction or more of a feeling of connection and sometimes a, a sexual attraction yeah intelligence as well you know the uh what they call sapiosexual now people who are attracted to people for intelligence but sometimes though, somebody's brain can make them really really appealing as a as a person as someone that you at least want to know more about or spend more time with it's like they are forms of seduction so so yeah it's, it's an interesting topic and i say that to a degree is a is a very much a mix of, a blend of influence and persuasion at work mm. yeah and then as far as uh, persuasion i want to just get it back to now the like more like um normal um let's say sales because i think one of your things is is like uh you are teaching service businesses um about like uh you know how to uh, do those calls and things like that like how to you know not persuade but how to you know be a better presenter and stuff like that and sure and 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 the big thing there is that um you know from i i was in that space i'm still in that space i was learning about it and i'm also you know hearing from people and and i think the common theme is that people in general um don't like selling like they don't really enjoy this whole process and then people don't like being sold to so like uh it's like this weird you know loop of like people who who sell don't like selling and then people who are being sold and they don't like it so <laughs> what do you think makes it so and and what are some maybe like advice for you to like um, 
you know, help people uh, like who have, for example, like service uh, or something they want to sell. And now it's the Zoom time. Like what, what can they do to maybe not hate themselves for selling the other people, you know, uh, you know, not, uh, not, not um, interpreting it as they are, as they say, a sleazy salesman. Sure. I think that, uh, that no, we talked about misconceptions earlier. I think sales is an area where people have many misconceptions and, uh, and we, m most of us have stuff, stuff around sales, let's say, uh, where we, we just have n a lot of negative associations. We have those associations of people who, even though I don't think this really happens so much anymore, but people who come and knock on your door to try and sell you stuff or people who phone you up at home, which does still happen. People who phone you up at home or just as you're about to eat your dinner and you end up getting a call from someone who's trying to sell you life insurance or something like that. It's like, those are associations that people have with sales as like as being something that just intrudes into your life to uh, people trying to sell you something that you don't really want and you know whilst that whilst that actually does exist sales really um, isn't about that and and i think it's getting away from those those associations is like sales should be and can be uh, about service about really helping helping the right people to have the right products and services that they need in their lives to be able to enjoy their lives more or to have more things that they want in their life or to develop themselves in a particular way or um, just to enhance their lives would be a good way to look at it. Uh, and so it, when people hear sales, they generally think sales is about convincing people to buy something whether they want to or not. And, and it's not, or at least it shouldn't be. Mm. So what are if you can share a little bit like what are what's your like uh you know like top advice uh, to to people that come to you you know to to learn about something like that and and let's say uh, they they are struggling with that um Well for for most of the people I work with most most of my clients are um either want to be professional speakers or need to speak and present in their business they or many of them have online courses and programs and and do online coaching and training and things like that so um in that in those situations my advice is to focus more on teaching rather than selling um because you can teach and sell at the same time uh, it's it but people that one of the biggest problems people have is like they'll do this sort of big presentation i and, I, and i've done it myself where you you do a webinar and then then suddenly you switch into sales mode and then it gets really, really cheesy and, and people start doing this, uh, you, you put know, the glasses in, in of, on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people start doing this sort of, uh, like, like you sometimes see in the, in the personal development world, like it, normally this would be, um, imagine $2,000 today. It's just 197 just for you. <laughs> and we're going to give you this and this and this, and it's like this, this tried and tested formula that, that does still work. That does still work. Um, but I was like you. <laughs> uh, that uh, almost convinced that convinces people to buy stuff uh, and uh, and i think again that's one of the things where um is is that integrity selling I, I would probably say for the most part no because so many of the people who are using those particular sales strategies and that is a strategy uh it's uh it's a what this particular kind of bookstore they call um in the personal development world, like your, your sales pitch at the end of a, uh, of a segment is your bookstore for, for a product or service. And um, so it's a particular kind of bookstore that follows a, follows a very specific formula. And um, so, you know, it's always, you always get the price contrast. You always get the, um, the, the time scarcity. You nearly always get the price ending in a seven. And, uh, you know, all these things you can almost guarantee your, your bonus stacks. You know, there's, a, there's a guy called Mike Winnick has a great YouTube channel that talks about the entrepreneur formula. That's the title he's given to this formula. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a formula that you, you regularly see. Unfortunately, uh, you know, whilst there are some on, and there's definitely honest traders and sellers and marketers out there who use it, um, the majority of people you see using this are, are selling crap. So. I think the problem is also that unfortunate or not this, they are effective. Like the yeah, they, they, they work as people, yeah. well, that's why they do it. Um, yeah, yeah, they are. 
but maybe becoming a bit less effective now. You know, if one yeah. thing we've seen this year is uh, uh, where a lot of marketing and uh, marketing channels are moving to is much more of a relationship-based uh, style of marketing, a connection and relationship-based style of marketing. And, and I do think things were already heading that way. This year has maybe accelerated that a bit more. Uh, and I think things will continue to and I, I'm just speculating here, but I think things will continue to go in that direction. Um, but we'll see. But, but for the meantime, you know, that stuff is still around. Uh, I think it's becoming less effective, but only really because more people are familiar with it and have encountered it. Uh, and also there are now people out there, there's a number of YouTube channels where people are sort of exposing these uh, scam artists online and, and the likes. Yeah, yeah, like CoffeeZilla and <laughs> Yeah, yeah, CoffeeZilla, yeah, he's great. Yeah. Um, so, so you think actually that uh, you can um, you can go without those those strategies and still effectively, in a way, sell. I think so. Yeah, I think so. I, I think I think there was no need for those kind of strategies. Um, people can sell much more effectively and, and in their integrity. I know if, if, if your goal is just maximum sales at any cost, then okay, maybe those strategies could still work for you. Um, but, uh, but if your goal is to, to, if you have an ethical framework and your goal is to get good sales and to stay in your integrity, hopefully, um, then I think there's enough you can do. And, and certainly for myself and many of the people I know um, who do marketing and for their own businesses, um, there are so many effective uh, and powerful marketing strategies that work so much better than those uh, and are so much more in integrity. And uh, so, you know, again, the, the tools themselves are not necessarily uh, evil. The, the sales formula isn't necessarily evil, uh, but there are many people who use it for that. Yeah, sometimes that, that was my path. Sometimes you have to like dip your um, toe in a way and like see that that side of the world to then finally come out the other side because for me mm. like i'm a person i believe at least and i want to be a person of integrity and like high moral standards but in a way at the start because before i'd had no encounter with sales before like uh, last year um and then when i get into it like i automatically kind of started doing some of it because that seemed like following some formulas is that seemed easier than you know, like it was just something that came like, oh, I'm, I'm just going to try, you know, like people say you should do this, ask these questions, do that. Then, you know, I, I'm going to do that. It seems better than not knowing what to do. And then eventually when I started like feeling more comfortable, you know, with, with, with speaking to people about it and kind of also believing more in my expertise, then finally I kind of, my brain like switched. Oh, I can just like really focus on understanding someone's problem, like what, what actually they, they, they're looking for. And then, you know, like truly from my heart, like say like, oh, I can help you and then really believe in it and try to, you know, tell people like how and what and answer all the question or say like, hey, I cannot help you like actually because uh, this is not something I do or maybe you are not the client I, you know, that's ideal for me. But it took yeah. like, it was a path. It, it wasn't like, oh, I started there. Yeah, it, it depends on what you do, how you operate, your own level of, of ethics and um, yeah, you know, your, your own moral framework. And uh, uh, I think many people, not, it's not necessarily the case that anyone who, who uses this stuff negatively is a sociopath, but it's certainly easier for, those, for people who have low empathy to, to, yeah. uh, to do that. Um, but I think you know, for, for the right incentive, most of us can put, uh, put our empathy aside and uh, and convince ourselves um that it's the the right thing to do or that this is the path or that we have to do it um you know we're we're um we're capable of uh, all of us are capable of anything um but we generally choose not to do those things because it's usually easier to to live within uh, and preferable to live within our, our uh, ethical frameworks hopefully and <laughs> that's uh, uh, you know I know from, from my experience, I, I have done sales training in the past, you, know, you sort of mentioned about sales. I, I don't train people in sales specifically. 
um, but I do train them in, in uh, I do sometimes work with sales teams to be able to help them on the connecting thing and be able to have, uh, um, you know, to come across better online, to be able to sound more influential and to act more in ways that are more likable and create more rapport with, the, with their audience members and, and or whoever they're talking to, or maybe a group of people or an individual. And that those things will ultimately increase sales for people because we we will buy from people who we like we will buy from people who we feel connected with and can trust um, but this is why i say relationship marketing is marketing is more important is that um, empathy is a, a really hard thing to fake ah so so if people think that uh, um you know you I'm not saying it's impossible to fake but it, it's really hard to fake it's really hard to sort of uh, to be sincere uh, in your in your caring about other people if you're not mm. so i think that's why relationship marketing marketing now is is something that uh, more people are feeling drawn towards mm. long term more long term definitely yeah and, and i think you know, to, to some degree you know, the, it's, it's been all the sort of sleazy marketing stuff like that that, that has contributed for the most part to that and um, so the the sort of slick sales um the slick sales presentation whilst it can still work and can still be very effective, it, it is becoming less so. And, and it is the cause of its own demise to, to a greater degree, because the more people do it, the, the more people are going to end up getting turned off by it and, and moving away from it. So yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, more natural. I don't know that relationship marketing is going to be the thing that goes on and on, but uh, I think for the foreseeable future, that's where things are heading. Mm, that's a that's a cool prediction. Uh, it's a cool take. Um, so so let's just like circle back on the last kind of thread. I wanted to close with that topic of of um, of, of influence, which is uh, and persuasion, which was uh, we wanted to ask you about. Uh, kind of on the other hand, on on defending against uh, persuasion, like what uh, what do you think um, people should um, kind of keep in mind or watch out for? um to to make sure they are not you know being steered in the in the direction that they are not aware of in a way like you, you know what i mean there is there is uh, th this comes back to something i was saying earlier and, and i think if there's one thing that everybody can do uh, and you don't have to read a book or take a course to be able to start to defend against this uh if the one thing that everybody can do is to take a step back take take a breath in a situation take yourself out of it into more of an observer position and just ask yourself what's really going on here what's what is this person's intention i think that's generally a good thing to do in life and to get into the habit of doing anyway but if you start asking yourself what is this person's intention in a situation is especially if you are feeling that somebody is trying to sell or put pressure on you in some way what is their intention what what are they trying to achieve here you know if someone's mean to you or says something that is a bit abrupt what's their intention were they trying to be mean is their intention to upset you or is their intention that they're that they don't want to upset you but they're in a bad mood and they just snap you know sometimes just taking that step back in a, in a breather um to think about it and observe and ask what's going on here and sometimes that's even useful for ourselves to ask what's my intention here like why why did i say that or what am i what am i hoping to achieve here um but when we take a step back from just being in a situation and um, you know i think there are many coaches who call this like the helicopter technique like you're sort of rising above it almost and looking mm. down at it like what's actually happening here you start to bring in a level of conscious awareness into the situation that at least puts you in a position of not just being led along by your emotions here but actually starting to think a bit more meta about the situation as the what is actually happening? What's going on? You're far more likely to start seeing what is really at play, the, the dynamics of the situation, than just being in it. Mm. So I think that's probably the, the most important thing anybody could do. Mm. I think it requires some, it seems like it requires for sure self awareness, which I think is a big one which most people have, I think in these days are lacking because I think you mentioned at some uh, at some point at the start I think it's hard, partially because of the lack of like solitude solitude and, and time for introspection and, and things like understanding yourself and, and the other I think is like um, I don't know if it's empathy but uh, but uh, like um, 
you know, like reading people in a way. Like, uh, you know, I, I think we, maybe because, I, I know, I'm curious your take, maybe because we now have less contact with actual humans, like not just COVID, but in general, like people, social media stuff, like we, I feel like I, the, myself, I don't know about you, like that, you know, a lot of people just like don't know how to talk to people. They don't know how to read people. They don't know, like they don't understand their emotions, like what's behind. Like it, for me, it comes yeah. now like through various experiences, traveling, learning about it. It comes very naturally. And I see like I'm way better than most people, but I don't know. What, what do you think makes it, it makes it so? And did I hit the nail on the head that it takes self-awareness and, and like kind of it understanding does. people? It does, and uh, and something that that to actually come up in a few of my conversations recently. It's not something. This isn't something I teach particularly, but it is relevant. Um, of uh, it, you know your emotional intelligence. Uh, some, often people will talk about this, but uh, it is important to have a reasonable level of emotional intelligence, and and uh, so an emotional investment in what's going on in in a situation. Um, so yeah, I think if you can do that. I mean, we can, we can, I think most of us can do this with kids very easily, right? But we're just less good at doing it with each other. You know, you, you, if your five-year-old child comes and says, oh, uh, mommy or daddy, you look really nice. And, uh, and the first thing you think is, what do you, what do you want? <laughs> what do you want? Uh, so we, we, we automatically are a little bit suspicious, a little bit, a little bit skeptical. And, and that's really what, uh, what we maybe could do with being a bit more of the time and just being a bit more skeptical very often we take what people say at face value, uh, especially if it's something that's written down, you know, we still tend to believe more what we read um, than maybe we should. Um, you know, people, there are people who are believing all sorts of crap on YouTube these days <laughs> and all sorts of things. Um, you know, just, just be, a, all, all I'm saying is whatever you believe or whatever you think you believe or are being convinced of, just be a bit more skeptical uh, and take a step back. Well, why do I believe that? Why do I think it's true? Is there evidence to back it up? Is it, is it reasonable? Um, you know, a bit, a bit of um, Socratic uh, questioning on it. Mm. Uh, like, is it is it true? Is it uh, uh, does it does it make sense? You know, uh, it, that's what it really takes. And uh, the more we do that, the more we practice it. You know, why these things aren't really taught in schools, I I, I don't know. Maybe, I'm sure there are some schools that do, but um, you know, as often gets said, schools teach us what to think, not how to think. Yeah, and, exactly. and often, often we don't end up really learning how to think critically or anything like that until we're much older, if at all. Because, and one of the main reasons for this, interesting, I think, is because you know, if you have a whole nation full of critical thinkers, yeah, so that's not good. It's going to be very hard to control. <laughs> so, uh, so it is, that in itself is a tool of uh, a social control of influence and persuasion. Yeah, independent critical thinkers. That's no yeah. good for for uh, for the, the people ab <laughs> above. <laughs> but it, but it's interesting. Like most people don't like the idea that that somebody could be controlling them, right? You know, and and uh, so. Um, right now you're seeing a lot of people thinking that governments are trying to control you by getting you to wear masks even right uh and you know if if that were really the if that were really the case then uh, i think it would need to be something more than that the, the reality is governments are controlling you but but in ways that you don't really see yeah. by by a lack of certain types of education like in critical thinking uh by conditioning societal conditioning to thinking that you know your only option when you come out of school really is to is to get a job working for someone else yeah um you know that this is your place in society all these kind of things that is where you're being controlled uh more than more than anything else uh, and the generally the stuff that we that we can't see is like it is invisible influence and uh, and social engineering and uh, uh, conditioned thinking and uh, um you know, societal you know, constructed societal expectations these are these are all the things that really control us and um, not everybody wants to address that and and often some often when people do they end up going down this whole rabbit hole of well if they're doing that it must be the illuminati and all this conspiracy I don't know. yeah i don't think it is but uh, personally i don't think so uh, but even if it is what you're going to do about it it's like uh, it's, uh, uh, you, you still have to get on and live your life at the end of the day but i i do at least think you know if we start if we start to understand more of our own cognitive biases if we even just start to be a little bit more skeptical of things in life um and, and question things more you know, then we're, we're a little less likely to be at risk from being convinced of stuff that isn't true or that could actually be could actually ultimately be to our detriment to believe mm. 
That's a good point. Great point. How people are taking notes. <laughs> so, so, so one, one, uh, like big topic before we, you know, kind of uh, wrap this up later, because I know you will have to be going. Um, is I wanted to know because I think you have a lot of like also insights in that, and it's very much connected. Is uh, you know, what role in all of that, which is persuasion, influence, but also kind of outside of that, what, what are, what's, uh, what's the role of uh humor and comedy in all of that because like i'm personally really fascinated by it i've been exploring like calling this also psychology of it and like mm -hmm. uh you were also talking about public speakers and i think a lot of like stand-up comedians also are amazing public speakers they understand how to play the audience so right. um and i also like myself in marketing and and in in in, in general in business i used humor in in many ways to like break down barriers to as an empathy tool to connect with people but uh, so, you know, I, I'm really curious to, to, to explore this topic, like what, because I know you personally are, are uh, kind of also interested in comedy. You use humor. You want to be a stand up comedian. I think you wrote somewhere. <laughs> so um, let, let's yeah, talk about that. Uh, not, not as a profession. I just want to at least try stand up comedy. Um, Me too. And, and, I, and I will. I will. I will do it. Um, but um, yeah, I it's interesting that most of the people who who teach and are known for talking and teaching uh, influence and persuasion tools um they don't really talk about humor comedy uh, and uh, even public speaking to a, to a degree but they don't really talk about these things as being tools of influence and persuasion uh, where, and i think they very much are storytelling as well storytelling is one of the biggest ones uh, yeah. and uh, and uh, again these things often interlace with each other um so you know you think of any most stand-up comedians don't these days don't tell jokes so there, there are some that do most of them don't most of them tell stories uh, and often the stories are very funny uh, and often they're just stories about their lives and their experiences um so you know they they end up marrying sometimes a a, a moral lesson in or, or an experience in with uh with some humor and with uh public speaking and with uh you know bit influencing a influencing a crowd to maybe see things even from a from a particular point of view and uh it is very powerful it's one of the most powerful i think you know if you can get a room of people on side with you laughing with you um then you've essentially won them over mm. um the the sort of thing of uh the likability the trust factor that is uh you know influence and persuasion skills are all about that all about creating trust and rapport and connection with your audience and one of the fastest ways to do that is laughter it is humor and there's also um you know neuroscientific evidence that uh, when we are when we when we're in a story when we're listening to a story um we uh, our brainwaves start to synchronize the audience member brainwaves start to synchronize especially if it's a funny story and we're laughing in the same places that we all start to feel connected or all part of uh, you know, all part of a group, we're all part of uh, the same team. We're all on the same team with each other. We're surrounded by other people who are laughing at the same things that we are. Um, that starts to automatically make us feel more connected and more trusting for the person who's leading us through that and, and taking us through that emotional journey. So yeah, they're, they're really, really powerful tools of influence and persuasion. Uh, some, someone who can make us laugh a little bit, intentionally or otherwise, um, has, a lot of, has a lot of sway. Mm. Do you think it's something? I'm in, in in a way also. I think uh, now it came to my mind that I think it 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 it, it seems like it's a, a quite uh, similar to 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 music in a way. The music also like, connects people yeah, in this yeah. way, right? Um, but but I'm curious uh, as far as like humor and and this aspect. Um, do you think it's something people can because that that's something I I don't have an answer to. Maybe you have like. Do you think it's something people can learn? Because like me myself, for example, I've always been. I can trace it back to my childhood, I think, like when I think about it, to, to being witty as this like defense mechanism against when I was like smaller and, and you know, people would kind of uh, attack me in a way when I was in school. I would always yeah. use like, you know, humor or, or attacking people's like insecurities in a funny way though, mm -hmm. to kind of defend myself. But no one would ever hate me because it was like a joke. And, you know, it was uh, but so, so for me, it developed like young and then I just kind of went on to it and, and I have it. But yeah, I'm yeah. curious, you think people can develop it in, in a way? And, and then if so, how? Yeah, m most people can. Um, so, you know, it's similar to you. <laughs> Houston, nice. Similar, similar to yourself. Um, I, I, uh, I developed uh, 
uh, and developed a sort of humor, humor and wit style, uh, more as a defense mechanism. In fact, may, maybe in my teens, I decided that uh, that would express itself primarily through sarcasm, but uh, which, which wasn't particularly healthy uh, and, and wasn't very pleasant as well for a lot of people. Um, but um, no, I eventually realized that that wasn't, <laughs> wasn't the best way to, to go about things. And it was uh, actually upsetting people more than anything else. Uh, which ended up upsetting myself. It ended up causing problems for me. And so now I'm, I'm a lot kinder with my humor. But um, yeah, I, I think most people can. For most people, it just takes a, a willingness to... Uh, you know, this, uh, I'm trying to forget, remember who's, who was saying this. Some, I think it was a recent guest of mine as well. Uh, he's saying, don't try to be funny on stage, just be fun. Um, so yeah, that, that will do it. You know, you don't need to be telling jokes. You just need to be fun and have fun. Some people, some people genuinely just aren't funny and, and they don't really find things funny and they don't really have much of a sense of humor. Thankfully, I don't know too many of them. In fact, I don't think I know anyone who doesn't have a sense of humor because I don't think we would really gel. Um, you know, I, I need, I need to spend time with people who, who laugh at things. Um, that, um, there are people out there who are just not probably never even with years of practice ever going to be funny um but most people i think can most people can can get there and can get to that humor so whilst i think it's a really powerful tool of influence and persuasion it's not for everyone and it certainly shouldn't be forced uh, okay. you know, any anyone who tries to force humor uh ends up just bombing that's i think what makes it uh, partially so effective right because you you can, but in, in, in some ways you, you can't like definitely, you definitely, you can't learn it easily because it's such a, well, it's, it's quite complex. Like, for example, you said that, um, you know, for example, you, you can't just tell a joke, like in a way, like, you know, uh, write it and, and, or like take someone's joke and just tell it. A lot of, that's not so funny. Like some people will laugh, but it's usually those like kind of like, as you said, storytelling and this like exaggeration of things and, and kind of bringing your some authentic thing into it, right? Like it's, it's yeah, you, you can't well, you, really you, like prescript if you, it. Yeah, if you think about some of the best speakers and, and certainly some of the best world's best comedians, uh, living or dead, um, Dave what Chappelle. you don't, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, rock, um, I was going to say, uh, Robin Williams uh, oh. would be a good example. Um, but, you know, there, there are many. Uh, but what they do seems seems spontaneous. That's spontaneous, yeah. yeah. And, and, but it isn't. It's, it, it takes a lot of practice to be, to be that spontaneous. Mm. And, and that's what people then get. It's like it kind of looks, they make it look like you just get up on a stage and do that. Uh, they make it look so easy. And it's not. It takes serious commitment and a lot of practice. Uh, for, you know, I have huge admiration for comedians. I, I've been interviewing lots of professional comedians recently. And uh, I just hugely admire anyone who gets up on a stage professionally uh, to sort of put themselves up there for, for the, and risk having people not laugh at their jokes or their stories. Um, you know, that, because that is always the chance. And uh, we're nearly nearly everyone who I've spoken to says that the, the audience connection is critical in, in comedy. You have to have that audience connection and uh, you, you then have to, you have to have a level of adaptability and flexibility to your audience to, so if, if, uh, if they're not loving the way you're going, if you just do your rehearsed five minute bit and carry on and they're not loving it and you don't change direction or course or, or acknowledge what's going on, you're, you're absolutely going to bomb. And some people, uh, you know, I'm aware some people do that. They, they just go through, oh, I'm just going to do what I've prepared. And, uh, but uh, the best comedians adapt, uh, but they have enough material and experience to say, okay, well, you're not loving that, so let's go down this road. And so they might end up changing what they'd actually plan to do for, for their routine. You can't do that if you just have to come up with it in the moment. Like, you know, it's, it's, uh, anybody ever puts you on the spot for anything, um, you know, the natural tendency is our minds go blank. So you know, it's just not going to work. But when you have a whole pool of resource, if you've practiced in improv, if you've practiced or been doing your material for, for a long while and have a pretty good idea of what hits and what doesn't with audiences, you can do that. Yeah, and that takes a look back to, for example, something like uh, this live interview. Like, I think if, if someone does not have, uh, like, you know, real actual experience and knowledge, but just something you know rehearsed where they like you know put somewhere up then they, they they're not gonna be able to like you know really dive into 
uh, so deeply like we did today because like they, yeah. they, their mind will go blank. I think it's like similar, right? Like they don't there, have the preparation yeah. behind it. The, there are some people who can, who can sort of, um, sort of bullshit the way through a little bit, but, but little most bit, people yeah. can't, most people can't get too far with that or it starts to become apparent after a while or, or anyone who, who does know what they're talking about is going to say, hang on a minute. <laughs> so, so yeah, it's, uh, you, you start to become aware fairly quickly when someone really has no real clue what they're talking about. You know, I, I, I know I grew up with a, I'm not going to say who it was, but a certain family member <laughs> who, uh, who likes talking about things that, that they don't really know that much about uh, and talking about them as if they do. And it's like, and, and you end up sort of sometimes biting your tongue and thinking, yeah, you really don't understand that. It's like, <laughs> um, but, but some people will just keep on talking anyway. It's like f either filling the air or, or um, trying to step in. There, there was that, uh, I don't know if you ever saw this, but there was a guy who was uh, interviewed by the BBC uh, on Breakfast News, I think it was. And um, they actually got the, they got a guy who I think was waiting for a janitorial interview or something like that. And they brought him on as being an expert on something or other. <laughs> and for some reason, he just went along with it. Yeah. Uh, and so, but of course, could he, he couldn't really answer the questions, but, mm. which, is, which is hilarious. But you know, that, that's generally the case. Um. Okay, so last thing, because I know we, we are short on time, I think now. Um, the last thing I wanted to kind of, um, you know, kind of know from you um, and maybe, you know, just some advice for the audience is, is I know you are a ferocious uh, reader of books and you are oh, even yes. a founder of uh, a book club, like a book club's review, right? Like book club. I, I have, uh, yeah, I, I do book reviews. So I, I initially set up a, a book club with it. It's, that, that's not really still going, but the book reviews are, and uh, I, I am still going to come back and do a, a whole podcast about um, reviews of personal and professional development books. Um, but on my, uh, on my LinkedIn, on my YouTube channel, yeah, there's a lot of book reviews. Mm, so what, uh, because I think yeah, I, I read something in the description that's something we have in common is that you say like, I think uh, most books uh, really are uh, not so good <laughs> or actually suck yeah. because, and especially now when there's like so many coming out. And so, um, I don't know, I don't know if my question would be to either, either like some of your recommendations, but maybe not general because it's too broad. You definitely have a lot. So maybe in that field of what we talked about here, uh, for, mm -hmm. for, you know, like, uh, the influence, persuasion, psychology, um, this type, or, um, yeah, maybe another question will be, and you can choose which one's better. Um, like, what do you look for in, in a book to, to tell or beforehand or why you're reading it to, to say, oh, this is like kind of, uh, you know, bullshit and there's not going to be much value or, or, <laughs> well, or, or, or this is a, a, an actual great book and and like what are some signs so like e either one because i know we have I time think, for yeah can, can maybe kind of address both uh here but uh the in uh so sticking in the area of influence and persuasion as that's most of what we've been talking about and um, there are uh I, you know I, I try and read everything i can get my hands on on that topic because you know that, that's uh, some it's an area where um you know, I'm, I'm hungry for, for more knowledge. I certainly come across books and people who call themselves experts who are really just rehashing um, Robert Cialdini or Robert Green. And, uh, you know, if, you, if you've read Cialdini's books on influence, the, the psychology of persuasion or persuasion, or you read any of Robert Green's books on uh, you know, influence and seduction and, uh, um, then you would see that straight away. So I was saying mm. that, that if you read the classics, you you will see when somebody's just kind of rehashing it and uh, maybe trying to put it. The, even then, there could, there could still be benefit to that, but uh, um, no, and often it, they will cite. Uh, usually, they will cite at least where where the learning has come from. But uh, a lot of it, a lot of the stuff I've read, really doesn't add anything to that. And so that that to me is like that's where I would class it. Like somebody might read that book and if they've never read the sort of classics in the area, they would probably get some benefit from it because that might be their introduction to that kind of information. Um, but if you, if you actually have the sort of master source material um, 
then you're reading something thinking, okay, well, what are they adding to the conversation? Where, where is their expertise here? It's kind of borrowed. It's, it's someone else's expertise. Uh, you know, we all have that to some degree. You know, everything we learn, we learn from other people, but um, you, know, you at least have to be able to apply your own take on it to hopefully add something to the conversation, even if it's just your unique perspective on it. And there's a lot of stuff out there that doesn't. So that's the stuff I classify as kind of being not worth bothering with and not worth learning from. Uh, you're far better to go to source materials where from from experts like Cialdini and Green. There, there are others out there. There are some really good books. A, a great one I read recently was by an author called Maria Konnikova. She was uh, uh, yeah, uh she's been Parker. yeah she's she's been uh, um, a, a New York I think she's with the New Yorker magazine as a writer for them. Um, but yeah, she she's done books about sort of the art of the con and uh, you know the, about people being con. That's a very big part of influence and persuasion very interesting very interesting stuff is like they um you get and and there are other people who write about these areas as well and so anything that gives you some insight and benefit is probably going to be a good read for you but if you can read from people who are really sort who actually know a bit of what they're talking about and aren't just uh, uh rehashing stuff for you uh, that's going to be more beneficial i think Mm, so the so the easiest place to start seems like is the you know to go to the classics first like the, yeah try the... and get try and get the classics first in, in any area if you want to know an area really well um, you should at least try and find out what the what the main pieces of work are in that area like if you ever want to learn the art of rhetoric and public speaking you probably should start with reading Aristotle's book on rhetoric and uh, so yeah start what you start with the classics and uh, uh, and work work out from there because once you've uh, once you've actually identified source key source material um you're going to recognize what sorts of just plagiarism or uh, or sort of re rehash and uh, and what's actually adding to that Mm. And what's also not like bullshit, because if it doesn't, it's like kind of disagreeing with the classic, then, well, it's possible that someone's super innovative and they come up with something yeah. huge, but the chances <laughs> are slim, right? Yeah, a lot, a lot of the times we accept information as being true because we don't know that it's not. And uh, so, yeah, <laughs> that's that's uh, an interesting area as well. It's one that sort of comes into cognitive biases, and you know, it's like, well, I think uh, understanding things like logical fallacies and things like that is a really important area. And uh, you know, R Rolf de Belli's book on the art of thinking clearly was a big eye opener for oh. me in that area. Uh, but uh, yeah, yeah, I think uh, uh, we we all we all have the capability to be. Uh, taken in by misinformation. You know, I mentioned to you that book, uh, Joseph Murphy's The uh, um, Power of Your Subconscious Mind. It's like, if I had read that for the first time now, I'd have a very different perspective mm. when I read it to when I read it, I'm trying to think how long ago that was, a lot of years ago, um, and, <laughs> uh, and kind of believed it might be true. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, maybe last thing, um, you know, what are some of your uh, like last thoughts? What do you want to leave the audience with? Uh, maybe also what, um, you know, where can people find you, find more about you? Um, some last thoughts, something I haven't asked you about, you haven't, you know, you, you didn't have a chance to talk about. Sure. It's just... Um so yeah, I, you know, I, I probably said a lot of what is important for me to say. I really just, I, I believe one of the most important things is being a bit more skeptical. You know, li, li, um, you should hear hear people out perhaps but but be skeptical about what information you're, you're taking in and i think that's one of the things maybe we haven't always been so much certainly in recent years as well it's led us to a lot of problems uh, a lack of skeptical or critical thinking has led us into a lot of problems politically and otherwise and so you just anything along that sort of path is is going to be good but if you want to uh if you really want to to learn more and to improve yourself you act absolutely must apply the stuff that you learn. It, you know, it was um, Lao Tzu um, who said that to know and not to do is to not truly know. And so I, I live by that tenet. I live by that, you know, you, you must apply what you learn. Otherwise it's just information. It's only, it's only knowledge when you actually use it. Mm. Okay. And where can people find you? So if people want to get in touch with me, uh, one of the best ways to do that is on my website, which is called presentinfluence.com. Uh, you can certainly find me on LinkedIn. That's where I tend to hang out the most on, on, on media, but also on Facebook as well. Uh, John A. Ball on LinkedIn or John Alexander Ball on Facebook. And uh, you can find me and my Speaking of Influence podcast mm. and my Facebook group as well. Uh, so the podcast is all talking with 
different guests each week about aspects of public speaking or influence or persuasion in some way or related areas. And uh, so it's a, a labor of love, but it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. Mm, great, great. Yeah, we didn't have time to, to, to talk about the podcast, something I wanted, but we ran out of time. Uh, anyway, maybe another time. <laughs> yeah, maybe another time. Yeah, but it's been, it's been a fun conversation. Thank you for giving me uh, space to, to sort of yabber on for a long while about all sorts of things that I'm passionate about. Yeah, yeah. Thanks so much, John. I, I had a blast, you know, talking to you about uh, all these topics. I hope people also had you know, a blast listening to it, but I also they have a, a lot of um, takeaways because that's like the most important, as you said, like to actually have the knowledge, but then implement it so they can actually figure out a way to how to, you know, you gave some book recommendations, you gave some uh, ideas like being more skeptical and what to think about, how to think about influence and persuasion. And then, you know, hopefully it can uh get some people down the rabbit hole because in a way it's just maybe it's a start of the path for some people right like you, you just gotta do a lot of your own exploring yeah well thank you for inviting me on your show and uh i'm sure you'll have uh, great success with it it's, uh, it's been a very nice experience yeah thanks so much mm -hmm.